Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. We are going to speak about likely and unlikely attributes. Um, we would present ourselves uh, shortly. Um, I'm Emil Kirsch. I'm uh, teaching at the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo. This year, I'm in a sabbatical uh, as a researcher in Stony Brook University, New York. I'm also a dev advocate at Incredibuild and the co-organizer of Core CPP in Tel Aviv. Uh, a slide on Incredibuild. We do build acceleration, so we may be able to dramatically uh, accelerate your CI pipeline. Talk to me about that if you have any need. Hi, I'm Tomer. Um, first time here, certainly first time presenting here in CVPCon. I uh, also uh, came here with uh, my wife and son. He was in the audience. I hope I won't make him cry. And um, that's it. I'm working Dell PowerFlex now. Uh, no, not much more to say. Go ahead. I mean, Let's go. Take it off. So, yeah. uh, about a year ago, uh, I presented in a meetup group, the Core CPP meetup, my plays with likely and unlikely. And in a very short talk, I, I presented that I see that it affects the assembly in some cases, but I couldn't see that it actually affects performance in my very superficial micro benchmarking. And on the same talk, Tomer was there, and he reacted on the talk like, oh, I'm checking it now, and I see that in some occasions something do happen. And since then, the entire year, we just researched that together. I mean, we played with that together and uh, decided that we have to bring a talk, and uh, we had the same talk in Core C++ last week in Tel Aviv. Now you get the edited version after getting some comments. Uh, so this is our journey through likely and unlikely. Uh, let's begin with, with how it looks. So C++20 added these two attributes. You can um, add annotation, add, add the attribute unlikely or likely. You can see it here on um, an if statement uh, inside a switch, on a case, a specific case. You can do that on a loop. Like for in this example, you can see that we say that the uh, n bigger than five is considered to be arbitrary unlikely. I'm using the word arbitrary. We would see it again later on. Uh, and it should hint the compiler to do something. And we will discuss what should the compiler do with that? What are the options for the compiler? Why do we say that? Uh, and on the other side, uh, we say that uh, case two is considered to be more likely, so we think we, with our data, or, or we want uh, case two to be optimized, to be more likely by the compiler in a way that it would be more optimized. Back to history. There were similar built-in attributes, for example, in GCC. So it is not something new, uh, but once it is in the language, in a way, you know, people would try to use it more and this is why it is important to check that to better understand how it can help you or maybe in some cases hurt you. Um, I would just say that in the built-in GCC attributes, you could actually say the percentage of the likelihood. So you could say it is likely and I'm giving it 90% or it is unlikely and I'm giving it 2%. And in the, build in, in the language attributes, um, you just say likely and unlikely, which makes sense. I mean, in, in many cases, you cannot actually measure or say what is their percentage. We will discuss that later. Um, anything more? Yeah, Stack Overflow has uh, some examples on the built-in attributes. So let's go to the spec. Um, in the spec, there is a quite long paragraph discussing the likely and unlikely new attributes. Uh, I, I would just focus on, on a certain sentence there. We would not read the entire thing. Um, so it says, uh, it is intended to allow implementation to optimize for the case where paths of execution, including uh, um, it are arbitrary, more likely than any alternative. Um, okay. Arbitrary, more likely. And this is kind of a weird attribute, right? Because Usually, um, spe the spec talks about syntax and semantics, meaning in here it talks about I don't know, statistics of the program. So it's unusual. And then down below, you would see another interesting note 
saying that excessive usage of either of these attributes, the likely and unlikely, is uh, liable to result in performance degradation, which, which some kind of a disclaimer saying, watch over, be careful. And we would talk about that. So hmm, we need to think about that. The, the spec says, beware. So why do we need that? I mean, what the compiler can do? Oh, yeah. Um, so compile is this uh, magical thing, right, that takes our codes in C++ and emits, uh, transforms it, and emits code for the machine, like machine code, byte code, has different names, assembly sometimes we call it. And um, what can you do with this information? Specifically the optimizer, right, because that's the part that even the spec mentions. Is this not, okay. Uh, so maybe it can improve the code layout. I mean, it needs to generate a file, an object file, and maybe it can put things in different positions where they're better or worse. Which um, may affect the instruction cache. Right, uh, we'll see about that. And uh, maybe it can improve branch instructions, like, you know, saying, we say this branch is likely, branch is the assembly name for the if or else or while or whatever. Maybe the, we say it, it's likely, it's unlikely. Can we put this in the branch instruction? Uh, maybe help or, uh, not help the predictor. And uh, you know, we can also ask are all the branches the same and uh, maybe, maybe there's other options as well. Anyway, uh, when we get to this level, we're already talking about architecture, even microarchitecture. It really matters on which processor you're going to run it. It's not this uh, virtual abstract machine that C++ has, it's a concrete CPU uh, with uh, caches and uh, memory bandwidth and all of that. Um, just as an example, we can take one of the recent ones, uh, Skylake architecture from Intel. And Intel even provides this specific diagram uh, if you want to understand uh, further what's happening. And things uh, generally uh, go like from the right, like, like this. Um, we move, we get the instructions from the main memory, from RAM. Uh, we move them closer and closer, first to the L2 cache, then to the L1 cache. Then it goes and, and gets decoded, and then it goes through the execution pipeline. And the execution pipeline, it looks short here. It's really long in, you know, in the CPU world. Uh, you really want to fill that up. You can't wait for some instruction to go all the way and then only feed the next one. You have to keep pushing them even before they're done. That means get, making decisions on the next branch before you even finish doing the calculation that this branch relies on. It means predicting, and that's the branch predictor. And, and the diagram that we see here is from Intel, but the idea of branch prediction is quite similar in other architectures. So it's not specific to Intel, but this diagram is from Intel, and eventually the optimizations that would be made might affect different architectures differently. So, uh, okay, we understand that code layout matters. We want things closer to us, so we won't have to go fetch them from the RAM, which is slow, while we're uh, using, doing things on the pipeline because then it won't come on time. So that means uh, we want all the hot instructions to come together and the cold instructions to not be there because they're taking up space for the hot instructions, right? So we don't want the, what's called iCache stress. We want it to be, you know, fill up all, with what do we want, not to waste space on other things. Um, Let's take a look at a specific example. So we have a switch, and uh, it's really straightforward, but it's a bit small, so I'll read it. We have a switch on integer x, and just a bunch of cases. Case zero calls, calls uh, function foo zero, case one, foo one, case two, foo two, and so on. And the last one is a default calls bar. And you can see that we do not have any likely or unlikely right. in this example. That's the most straightforward case. Uh, we can take it to uh, Compiler Explore, which I guess everyone knows uh, by now, and um, we can see what it does with it. So, for example, uh, generally it, it makes them in an arbitrary order. It doesn't really care, like, uh, well, sorry, actually we'll look at that in, in a second, but uh, first it needs to handle the switch logic itself, so that's uh, these a few instructions, and first of all it compares our input to nine because that's the maximum number we have there. Uh, if it's over nine, that's the default case, so it already needs to jump to the default. Otherwise, it needs to do uh, something that is called um, indirect branch. Uh, that's the feature of switch. That's why there is a switch in C historically in C++, because we can do it in the processor relatively efficiently. Uh, so it uses, it uses the jump table. 
to jump directly without doing a bunch of if else, if else, if else. Um, and then we have the actual cases. So the first case is here, and the second case right after it, and the third case right after it, but not generally two because uh, the eighth case is first for some reason. I think it's just like arbitrary order that comes from some kind of hash table in the compiler or something. The only one that is actually kind of getting special treatment is the default, which is last. So it seems like right now we already have some kind of hint to the compiler in the way we write the code. The compiler sort of assumes that the default case is kind of called probably and puts it in the end without us saying anything specifically about it. Can we change that maybe? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I should have uh, waited for that. And uh, yeah, let's put likely on one of them and unlikely on the other. And uh, we'll see that if case five is unlikely, then it goes to the end, but not really the end because default is still after it. And uh, the likely case is first. That means that we have a better chance uh, while already reading the top part of the logic, already maybe getting the first uh, option, the first case, right with it into the cache, so it will be uh, useful to have it there if it is in, indeed, uh, indeed likely. And um, we can move it and try to put the default likely and see what happens, and yeah, now it's first. So by default, our compiler thinks that the base case, the default case is unlikely, but we can say otherwise if you really want and we know what we're doing. Uh, we should say that we see these things with a certain specific compiler. We will discuss that later that different compilers may act differently, of course. Right, but as, as long as you mention it, if you do this specific thing with Clang a little VM, put a likely on the default, it actually brings it even farther up into the switch logic itself. So in that way, LLVM is even better, or at least more aggressive than GCC. Um, so, okay, we now see a bit about why, and we see that, yes, we can improve the code layout for improving the iCache, just with, uh, you know, hints for the optimizer. Uh, okay, so we talked about the branch predictor a bit, and it, it, it can be confusing, um, because there's kind of two branch predictors in the world, uh, sometimes they call that, one, in the CPU world, in the architecture, architecture world, uh, this branch predictor sees a stream of instructions and it needs to predict the most um, probable execution path. It sees um, machine code, byte code. It doesn't see your whole program. It sees a small window from the stream of instruction that it runs. It might go, come back to the, next, to the same instruction again. That might happen if you have a loop. And uh, that's why it, it does pass, um, base its predictions on the previous uh, execution. So if you went through some branch uh, instruction once and you, j you took it, you jumped, and then twice you again jumped, third time it's most certain that you will jump again. That will be the prediction of the CPU. If it fails to predict correctly, then it might uh, predict the other way around, and then you start filling up the instruction pipeline with incorrect instructions. Those are not the instructions you should run, and that's uh, called a prediction failure, and it's very costly. You need to throw out all that information and sort of go back and try again. One of the most uh, um, known questions in Stack Overflow discusses that the why it is more efficient to go over a sorted uh, container, even if you add the sorting into the benchmark, uh, and, and the reason is branch prediction. I think that we have yeah. here the link. That's it. Yeah. And on the other hand, in the compiler world, we also have a branch predictor, and it also needs to predict the execution path that is most likely, but it has uh, some things that are better. It sees the whole program at once. It can analyze it in, in a high-level fashion. On the other hand, it doesn't see the actual execution, right? It just needs to look at it statically during the compile time, although uh, we have uh, profile-guided optimization, sometimes called feedback-directed um, optimization, and that can help. And one of the questions is how the compiler from its branch predictor can affect the CPU. So, for example, suppose that the compiler, the compiler can give some command to the CPU saying, oh, I want you to know that this part, this path is more likely, maybe the compiler can do something for the CPU. Otherwise, it, is, it would be just the layout. Right. Um, but before we get to that, let's uh, look at the CPU patch predictor more closely. 
And uh, we'll take just a small example. I have this uh, function uh, doing uh, logarithm of two on, on ints, uh, just with a while loop. And um, we can, as humans, uh, look at it from a high level uh, perspective and draw this uh, nice uh, decision diagram. Um, and see, you know, you have the loop the, inside the green border, and you have uh, the decision if, if n is uh, greater than zero or not. If it's two, you go one way, you stay in the loop. If it's false, you go out. And uh, if you stay in the loop and get to the end of the loop, you go back always to the start. Um, the CPU, when it runs it, it will probably see that we're staying in the loop more than exiting. It will see that based on past execution, see that it's more likely and kind of just optimize for it live. Maybe first time it won't know anything, but second time, third time, fourth time, it will see that this is the most likely case. Start optimizing for that, start predicting that. And that's despite not knowing anything about this program. It doesn't see this image. It just sees a stream of instructions. Um, can we affect this, like Amir said? Um, well, it's called a branch hint. We can put it in the assembly code, or rather we could do it in x86 at, at one time. On, uh, historically, it was uh, called uh, 2E for the not taken or 3E for taken. You just put this before the branch instruction itself. It was a kind of a failed experiment because it, it was added in Pentium 4 and then immediately removed that right after that. Uh, already one of those instructions or hints is used for another feature in the newest processor. And uh, you're probably not writing C++ 20 for Pentium 4, right? So we can ignore it and you know, decide it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, ARM architecture just doesn't have it at all. No hints. Um, power has hints, but uh, from what I tried out with uh, Compiler Explorer, it usually isn't emitted in the code. So if you're doing performance-oriented work on one of these um, architectures, you're probably not going to be able to affect the actual CPU with your hints, with the likely and unlikely. Um, another thing we can ask is, uh, we see a cold branch. That's the first time we see it. So I know what's happening now. The CPU can't predict it yet. And uh, curiously, Intel and AMD actually have um, conflicting guidelines on it, or conflicting rules. Uh, Intel does one thing when it sees a, a branch the first time, and AMD does another thing. But do we really care about this uh, performance-wise? Uh, I mean, it's just the first time we see it. We're going to run in that loop. If it's the first time, it's not hot path. It's not where our bottleneck is. Even if we come back later to that, um, well, if it's much later, then OK. It might think it's, again, the first time because it already forgot about what it saw. But I mean, again, it's not the hot path. It took us a while to get there again. So it's not very interesting for performance. And um, indirect branches are a bit more complicated, like in the switch example. But uh, the basic principles are kind of the same. So in summary, I think we can say not really. We can't really affect uh, the CPU branch predictor with likely. Uh, it's just better to let the CPU do its thing. It kind of knows better than us. Um, so we can't affect it, but we can affect the compiler, right? Um, so we already saw how we can affect the compiler with the switch case, let's see it now with uh, a loop. And again, we see this uh, diagram, and I mean, I do it like that, not because I like the colors, but rather because uh, we can give GCC a specific uh, command to generate this automatically. So GCC is pretty smart. Uh, it's not a human, but it's, it's pretty smart, maybe smarter than a human. It, it can generate all this uh, information for us, for us. And we see, again, the loop uh, with a green box. And we see that going back with the blue arrow, dashed arrow on the right is 100%, right? We get to the end of the loop, we have to go back. That's 100% of the cases. But the two branches from the decision uh, get interesting numbers. They get 11% um, and 89%. So we didn't say anything, right? But already GCC knows that staying in the loop is more likely. It's 89% likely, and exiting is 11%. You had the command uh, um, compiler um, command at the below if you want to uh, create your own PNG, your own image for your code. Right, but do it only for one function, otherwise you'll get an image this big. Um, so if we go to the assembly, we can see that um, adding likely can do something, um, maybe. 
This is the code before, likely, the one we saw before, and adding likely um, changes this name of the function because we didn't have another name, but um, other than that. Do you see any, do you see maybe you have a sharp eye? Do you see any difference yeah. between the uh, two? Yeah, I think there's no difference except the name. So why is that? Because if we go back to this thing, now with likely, we see that the percentages changed a bit. Now the 90% and 10%. So it did affect the compiler, but not enough to actually do anything. I mean, the compiler doesn't care if it's 89% likely to stay or 90% likely to stay. It's going to emit the same assembly code, right? In this very specific example, it might be that we have an example with more branches in which it may change the code layout. Uh, we do see another small change here. Um, we see that it says here, uh, I don't know if I can actually show this with the screen, but maybe it will, okay. Uh, it says prediction, predicted likely by hot label predictor. That's uh, saying the predictor, this is predictor, read our code, and the predictor that ran and caught this decision is the one that looks for the likely attribute. So very smart of it. Just saw our attribute and took it, and that's the predictor that was activated. And we're also got, starting to get an answer on uh, one of our questions from before. Uh, how much is arbitrary more likely? Seems like it's 90%. In GCC. Right. Um, <coughs> so adding likely is mostly useless, at least in, in this case. Uh, but let's try the other way around. Maybe, okay, we say okay, the default is staying in the loop. That's what uh, GCC thinks by default. But let's, uh, we for some reason know that this loop is just like uh, the weird way we write our program and we want to exit fast or maybe not even enter the loop. Um, so let's switch from likely to unlikely and indeed we get the other way around in the percentages. Now it's 90 for exiting, 10 for staying. And um, we can compare the two versions in the assembly and here we have a difference. The unlikely version took the return, that's you know, going to the end of the function and just put it really near the start of the function. So that means that if indeed we don't take the branch, we, it's really easy to return from the function. It's already there, the instruction. Uh, okay, so we said that GCC a lot of times here, and uh, I don't want to start a flame war here between compilers, but uh, we need to talk about the difference. We took this example from GCC, and uh, it has this nice visual uh, overview of the function, so that's useful for us. But uh, the problem with Clang isn't just that it doesn't have a visual uh, um, output, it's that most of the time it doesn't do anything with likely and unlikely. Uh, the switch example, it does do something, and all the rest, I, I just couldn't see anything. So um, we'll focus on GCC, so it will be interesting. Um, okay, so we'll see more examples. Again, using GCC, we'll use x86, that's still the most common, and uh, do um, optimization level O3. Uh, let's look at an early return. That's when we have some if that goes away, uh, does a return from the function. So we have again this logic, and um, we already see here, sorry, that um, we have these num low numbers like 5% of going out or, uh, from, on both arrows. That means that um, GCC by default, before we put any attributes, already thinks that it's 5% uh, likely to do that early exit, right? Um, yeah, I actually have arrows here. And it would be interesting to see if we say unlikely, what would be the change? Because without saying anything, GCC assumes that 5% likelihood for getting out early from the loop. Right, and uh, so yeah, let's do that. Let's do unlikely. And um, notice that the unlikely is only inside the if. So we don't affect the prediction of going into the loop or staying in the loop, but we do affect the prediction of doing the if, and that indeed now changes. Um, sorry, it's kind of small for me here. <laughs> um, right, so we, we change it from 5%, which was before, to 10%. That's the unlikely default, right? That's the arbitrary unlikely, it's 10%. Which is interesting, because when we didn't say anything, it was 5% early return. And when we say it is unlikely, then the compiler says, oh, it is unlikely, so 10%. So yeah. the unlikely is more likely than saying nothing. Right. This is how it works. But on the other hand, if we do likely, then yeah, now we are saying something interesting and it goes the other way around. It doesn't mean that eventually there would be a difference in the assembly, because maybe 5% and 10% would emit the same code. But it might be that in some cases with more branches, you may say unlikely, 
and get a result which is more likely than saying nothing. And, and by the way, I have no idea which one is, is better, like putting likely or unlikely. It's just a slide example, and it depends on the input, right? Because uh, different inputs might have different uh, behaviors. Let's talk about exceptions a bit and see how that acts. So here we have a very simple function. Uh, validate takes a string view, and if it's uh, too short, then it throws an exception that the password is too short. Um, we have this uh, nice drawing. And here we have something even more um, extreme. It's 0%, 0% to take the exception. It's even more than that because um, GCC even splits the function into two functions. You see this uh, snippet, that's the first part, checking the size. Then we have another snippet, which is also marked clone called. That's a kind of a hint for the, uh, for the linker later on. It says to the linker, this part is called, this whole function is called, when you link the whole program together, you can take this part and just put it as far away as possible. No one wants it. Which, which means that in the executable, it might be that the same function would be splitted into two parts inside the executable. And uh, what happens if we make it likely? So first of all, that's not going to pass code review, right? I, I hope. But if we do that anyway, um, it's still 0%. So, so GCC ignores that. It says, no, you are not right. Yeah, and you can also think about it as like GCC doesn't know what to do with this. Like, yeah, what's up with you? Um, so uh, let's take some less slide where more real code. I, okay, I have to admit it's a bit modified, but basically this thing exists in the in the Linux uh, code base in the kernel, and we have this uh, likely unlikely macro. That's the original part because uh, you know Linux kernel is still in C, not uh, didn't move to C plus plus yet. Um, so this is the old version, right? Like we talked of the un of unlikely, but you can think of it as being the same. So we have this thing: if it's unlikely that this pointer is null, then you know just return with an error message, an uh, no, error code. Sorry. Um, okay. So what happens here? The percentage to uh, prediction to jump right to the return is um, looks like zero percent. If you look closer, it's something like. Um, when you do not put the unlikely. Didn't put anything here, it's 0.45%. How did we get to that specific low number? Well, you need to think like a compiler for a second and look at this uh, and ask, what's the, what's the uh, likelihood of getting here? So, you know, originally we start off with 100%. And then um, we compare, we, to get here, we need to compare a pointer to null. That, that's right, that's the if condition. That already shows us, shows the compiler, that it's probably not the likely case. Then, it's, if we get there, it's an early return. That's also kind of fishy, probably not the likely case. And um, not only that, we turn a const number. Again, seems like not the usual case. And not only that, it's a const negative number. So, okay, no way that this is the intended use of the function. This is probably called and the, this is the result. And these numbers come from GCC code. Right. I mean, when you uh, dig down into GCC, you see that GCC calculates the likelihood based on these assumptions or these rules. Yeah, also you can see it in Compiler Explorer if you open some of the more complicated views, but it's not going to be so visual uh, uh, and nice. And, and then the question is, suppose that we do say unlikely, how more unlikely could it be more than 0.45%. Right, so then the developer comes and puts, puts the unlikely, and the compiler sees it. Oh, the developer said unlikely, that's minus 90%. And again, the unlikely keyword, the unlikely annotation says, oh, it is um, less unlikely than saying nothing. Okay, so uh, we saw some things about uh, the compiler uh, predictor. That's the bench predictor of the compiler. It, we saw that it has a nice, uh, interesting heuristics, right? It's not uh, trivial. The way we write our program informs the compiler, the optimizer, of our intentions, not that's just the basic logic. And uh, likely and likely is a way to override that mechanism, but it's a very crude way. Currently, with the current implementation, it right. may change. It may take both the logic of the compiler and add something, but it is not the case currently. And uh, if you really want something more specific, maybe you know, consider using a PGO and make sure to run it on the inputs you really care about, whether they're representative or not. 
Uh, Stefan had an interesting talk, uh, lightning talk about that yesterday. You might care about optimizing the non-specific, the non-typical uh, uh, use cases. That's also a consideration. So, okay, okay, we saw some um, theories, th theory, and uh, let's look at actual benchmark because, I mean, benchmarking is hard, but we still care about the performance, so uh, we have to do it, even though it's a micro benchmark, which is even harder. Um, I mean, it is easier, but to get actual results is, is harder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's uh, took this in is prima function we saw before with the nice early exit and try to uh, compare two versions. We'll use uh, AWS because it's easy. And uh, we'll run on Ubuntu in case you want to reproduce this at home. Okay, so I did run it with dash O2, and you might ask why. And I have uh, several reasons. The basic uh, idea is that there's a good chance that whatever code you write is going to eventually run on dash O2 for various reasons. People still don't always use O3 for, over, for optimizing things. And also, I mean, it's the same conclusion, so it's okay. So these are the two versions. One has Likely, one is unlikely. The unlikely is more or less, we saw what the compiler only thinks, just, but just for comparison, we actually put it specifically, explicitly. Just a question to you. Uh, which one do you think would have better performance? It's a tricky question. It depends on the input, right? So suppose that we have some certain input, then the, the question is, would we see any difference in performance? So uh, this is the benchmark. Uh, we have the two functions. We declare them on the top. We call in main, um, we initialize a vector of numbers. We do that outside of measuring. And then we have the definition of the benchmark. We'll see that in a moment. And then we call the benchmark on the fun first function and then the benchmark on the second function. And this is the benchmark. I actually took this from CP, uh, CPP reference uh, with some small modifications. Basically, we have a lambda and we uh, take the snapshot of the high resolution clock and then we run the function over all the numbers in the vector, and then we take another snapshot of the clock and we print the difference. This is the result. So using likely took 6.6 .6 seconds, using unlikely took 5.9, almost six seconds. Likely is slower by 10%. Which doesn't say anything important because we, again, it depends on the input, but there is still one important question, is it, actual result or it, just, it is just maybe noise? Right, so we need to stop and think, are we doing this correctly? Um, so one um, uh, article that I really recommend reading is called Producing Wrong Data Without Doing Anything Wrong, uh, Anything Obviously Wrong. And uh, it really shows how just by compiling in a slightly different way, you get vastly different benchmark results, even without a specific reason. Like you're not really import, improving, um, at least intentionally, you're not improving the algorithm or the code layout. It's just noise from the environment. And uh, they show very high percentages there. And uh, like, like for example, our benchmarks are, are ordered in a certain way. Suppose that you order them differently, it might be that you would get different results, which means that, oh, it was noise. And uh, one of the things that really affects it is the code location, right? And, and we already know that because we talked about it for the iCache and everything. So we're measuring something and we are also getting measurement noise from the same thing. That makes it even harder. Uh, so, okay, we, we need to like, think about it critically. Let's try something. Let's try to just switch the order of declaration. I'm not even changing the order of calling them, just the declaration. And suddenly uh, we actually get the same time for both. You can also ask what happens if I change the order of the call, but you know we always see that we're having some trouble here, so let's do something uh, better. Let's just... Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit curious. Maybe, maybe it's the exact same assembly. Yeah, so yeah, a measuring is hard, but looking at the assembly is easy, relative. Uh, let's compare them. Uh, so it's kind of small, but I'll, I'll summarize it for you. There's no difference. Both functions, with the likely and unlikely, are the same which uh, should like, uh, raise a light bulb, like wh why are they the same? We did see differences, right? So first of all, we see this article, like the conclusion striking again. We have no difference between the two versions of the functions. And despite that, we saw 10% dif difference. That's a lot for no difference. 
And uh, the reason for them being the same is that there's a compiler bug in GCC. If you put the same function twice, one with likely, one with unlikely, then uh, one of the comp optimization passes in GCC called uh, identical code folding thinks they're the same thing and just falls them into one copy. So there would be two instances of the function, but it would be compiled once because the compiler says, oh, it seems like something that I compiled already. Right. It can stay one if you maybe compile with oh, dash OS, I don't know, for reducing the size, or it can be later split up back into two. Really depends on all the optimization passes you have there. Um, it's a nice bug, by the way, and, and the one that opens that was Tomer. Yeah. <laughs> and it was uh, um, approved. I mean, it is confirmed. confirmed yeah. It is an actual bug. So eventually the, the compiler, if it sees the, both functions, which are uh, the same, one with likely and one with unlikely, and it might be that we actually want in our code two paths. Because in some cases we call this one, and in other cases, based on the information, based on the data, we may want that, the compiler just ignores. So the question is, if we would separate them into two compilation units, what would happen? Right. So let's try that. Let's do two compilation units separate and have the benchmark actually in the same compilation unit. Why not? And uh, for likely, we get 6.0 6 seconds. Sorry. And for unlikely, 6.6 .6 seconds. So now we got that likely is faster by 10%. And remember, the first up, uh, result was that it was slower by 10%. We got the uh, reversal. So my take from this is, first of all, um, this still might not be actually a likely, likely and unlikely playing a role here. I'm still not convinced of that. It still might be artifacts. But uh, we do have a difference, so there is something here. And uh, that might be useful for you, but it, it's useful for you only if you actually measure on your specific code, on your inputs, on your compilation flags, on your configuration, on your computer, on your architecture, and microarchitecture. Architecture. You need to get all of those right to actually use those results. Um, we do have some results, so let's try to dig it a bit deeper and see what's the difference. And we have this nice uh, Linux tool called Perf. Uh, if you're running on AWS, you should know that uh, the cheapest instances don't, aren't able to run Perf because it's all a virtual machine. You need a slightly um, pricier option, and then you get the whole machine to yourself. And um, if we comp run perf on these and compare, uh, we don't really see significant changes. One of them has more context switches, but it's also the one that runs longer, so it might just be you know taking longer, so more context switches by the OS. But that's not that doesn't look like the key difference in performance. But that's because we're not looking at the thing what we already saw that matters. That's the iCache, the code layout. Uh, so let's do it again, but this time I'm perf with a slightly different command. You can see it on the bottom here. And we want to collect just the cache, uh, cache information. And the first one is the iCache misses. And there is a small difference here. It's almost 4%, which kind of makes sense given the around 11% difference in performance. And again, this might be due to likely unlikely. It might be due to just you know other side effects caused by the compiler. But I think it is interesting to see that um, we can see a connection between performance and iCache misses. So in a way, we see the analysis from the we have the likely unlikely, different code layout, and at the end, different percentage of cache misses. And uh, yeah, that might still be an effect. So let's summarize what we uh, saw till now. Uh, so potential ben benefits of likely and unlikely. Um, it affects the compiler branch predictor, which may affect code layout. It may improve instruction cache. However, however it doesn't actually affect CPU's branch predictor uh, unless you uh, assume that the uh, code layout affects that in a way, but we saw that it affects different arch architectures differently. So trying to convey the message through the code layout for the branch predictor is something quite difficult. It is more important, the uh, cache locality, the I cache for the CPU. Um, is it worth the hassle? So in most simple cases, the answer would be no. I, I mean, if, if the compiler assumes the same thing that you would tell it, so why, why should you tell it? it? It might be even a pessimization because maybe the compiler would assume 5% and saying unlikely would then fall back to 10%. Uh, 
Um, but in some cases, uh, it might be that you actually do affect the assembly and your performance. So you should just try on your code. I mean, the first thing that you can check is, is there any difference in the assembly? Because if there isn't any difference, or maybe if you see like the diagram, and you see, oh, the compiler analyzes my ints in the wrong way, so maybe I just should just drop that. And it may change in um, future versions of the compiler. So uh, as any performance optimization, you know that when you switch to another environment, you need to measure again. You need to, and, and if you need to measure again, or maybe your code changed. And, and if your code changed and you just miss the likely or unlikely and you put it in the, in the same location where it was, then again, it is a pessimization because maybe data changed or your algorithm was changing. Bottom line, be careful with what you ask for. Uh, the same way it may help. Yeah, this is a message for not only for programming, anything in life. Um, if you ask for something, you may get that. Maybe it was not what you actually wanted. The same way it may help, it can also help performance, either by having the wrong analysis or the wrong number, or maybe, yeah, it got the right number, but I put the likely on a branch which is not, should not be likely. You should think about that. Consider using likely and unlikely only in cases where the call ratio between the branches would be significantly different. Um, it says also then what the compiler would assume, which is quite difficult. How can I know what the compiler assumes? Well, you can take a look at the compiler analysis with the diagram in GCC. Uh, and only in cases where it should matter for performance, like usually we say, do not go and do performance optimizations too early. Only if it is the bottleneck, otherwise you are just playing and, and you know, it's it just boilerplate in your code, just noise in your code that would may do something, nothing or something. Take a look at the assembly. We saw that in some cases the benchmark so shows something, but it is nothing because the assembly is, is the same. So you just thought that you have something, but if the assembly is the same, it is noise. Looking forward, our suggestions. So if it, is go if it goes to compilers, we may think that maybe GCC should fix the identical code folding bug opened by Tomer. Uh, and it was co confirmed, so sometime might be, uh, it, it may affect other issues, not only the likely and unlikely. Maybe other cases where two code snippets which looks the same, but have some difference, the compiler compiles them the same. There is an online question there that I would take at the end of the slide. Um, and it might be um, good for GCC to use the likely and unlikely hint together with, with its own logic. So maybe when we say unlikely, we mean more unlikely than you would assume, and not unlikely is 10%. Yeah, but you assumed it should be 1%. So by saying unlikely, it becomes more likely than saying nothing. Maybe this should, be, this should change. And, and by looking at the code, one may assume, oh, it should be quite easy. No, it is not. It is a mess. Uh, but, but this is why compiler implementers do this stuff, they can do that. Yeah. Um, and Clang, well, Clang do need to do some things there as well. Um, language, maybe it should be a function expression like the old uh, likely and unlikely because then maybe you can, um, you know, give pass the chances, the likelihood that you want to use. So we, in, in our examples, we used uh, uh, in all cases only a single branch. But you have, if you have uh, several branches or a switch case, you can put more than a single likely. But then the compiler would assume that, oh, they are both likely. And I want to say, this is more likely, this is a bit less likely, but also likely. And then you need to add the percentage, which you cannot do with the current uh, attribute. I think also the attribute, the use of attribute is kind of more complicated because you need to think about code paths and having an expression is just much more simple. So, why complicated things? It seems that the old maybe built in was nicer. But uh, we don't think that it would change, so it is just uh, uh, a thought. Um, and, and language support, uh, so um, I think that we talked about that, but maybe to have uh, um, an ability to mix between PGO and, like, suppose that PGO 
you, you run profiler guided optimization and you get back the results and not only for recompilation, but in order to change your actual code. So it could feed in the likelihood and then you can play with that. So today you got it as, as an uh, output from the PGO and you can recompile. Maybe it could affect your code by putting the percentage in the code, allowing you to later on uh, decide whether you want to keep it, to change it, etc. which today you don't have this ability. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. And if there are any questions, we are here for questions. Oh, there is a question online. <laughs> I think we will start with a question online because it came a few slides ago. Um, this is a question by Daniel Brown. Did you attempt a quote unquote control benchmark comparison without either likely or unlikely for the last section? You mentioned previously the default case, not telling it anything, might be optimized better. Would that provide an alternative baseline to compare the other examples against? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, it was a long so question. <laughs> Did you attempt a control benchmark comparison without either likely or unlikely for the last section? You mentioned previously the default case, not telling it anything, might be optimized better. Would that provide an alternative baseline to compare the other examples against? Okay, I, I, th okay. I think the question is asking, like, what if we had a third option that doesn't have either, neither likely nor unlikely in that function? And I, it might be better, it might not be better. I think it complicates things because you don't, uh, you compare, don't compare like to like. You compare like one with attributes, one without attributes. Practically speaking, we might see the same as the unlikely case because that's kind of, the original prediction, we won't see the bug. That, that is a difference because somehow the cold, identical fold, cold folding bug only happens when you have attributes in both, uh, even though the attributes are different. Uh, so if one has an attribute and one doesn't have, you won't see the bug. I think the results will be similar. Anyhow, we do encourage you to make your own benchmarks and, and you would get different results maybe and come up again next year to, to speak about likely and unlikely. But the, the, the understanding that results are quite noisy and, and you cannot very simply see any difference or you know, it changes, this is the important part. Which means that, okay, before we play with that, let's make sure that we actually have any improvement. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for doing all the uh, heavy lifting and large research on this, because it, <laughs> it takes time to get any kind of sensible values. Um, I have a question on the syntax placement of the attributes in that I found in my quick testing that, particularly on an if statement, um, the placement for Clang especially really mattered. So in the very early slides, uh, I think you have it placed right after the if expression and before the curly. That seems to be the sweet spot from what I've seen. But in more of the other cases, you have it inside the um, if block. Yeah, um, that's why one of the reasons I don't like uh, it's a, it as an attribute. An attribute is kind of hard to pass for me. Um, it should be before some, before and express uh, a, a statement, sorry. It comes before a statement. So when you see it like this, this is, is like putting it on this, you can think of, of it as being on one line, likely return false or unlikely return false. In this case, it's just one statement inside the block, so it doesn't matter. If we put it between the condition and the curly braces, it will affect the whole block. Again, in this case, it's the same. And uh, I think you can maybe even put it between the if and the condition. I'm not sure about that. Uh, it can certainly go in front of the if, but then again, you're just saying at a top level block, this is an unlikely instruction, which is a strange thing to say. Right. Uh, but yes, I have certainly seen uh, quite a bit of difference from uh, with mm -hmm. saying the, the block essentially the if is unlikely as opposed to just what's inside the block being unlikely. Right, so yeah, one of the examples is this one uh, with the switch. And yeah, it comes yeah. before the case. It was also, I think, come after the case. 
I think attributes are kind of weird. Sometimes they really make sense because uh, they talk about control flow, um, but the syntax in, in general is, is complicated. But, but, but Stefan, you can check, again, with GCC and see the analysis and the percentage that are given, yep. and you would see, I guess, that you would get the same percentage if you put it on uh, the last uh, statement in the if or on the first one because it affects the entire branch. I, I certainly imagine so. I haven't run it, but definitely something to try. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. There was a question from online. I have to paraphrase this one a little bit. Uh, the question is, um, what is the effect of a bad hint on the instruction cache? Will the actual likely part uh, go into the instruction cache later? So we saw that uh, the percentage affects the code layout. So if you do a bad hint, it might be that you would send something that should be hot to be underneath, to be below, and then you may have performance hurt. It may hurt performance. So uh, again, as the same way as it can improve performance by changing the code layout, if you have bad hints, if you believe it can do good, you should believe it can hurt as well. Yeah, and if you think about it naively, you might think, okay, I'll just put likely on everything and optimize everything. But obviously, they're in competition, and once you, put, you mark something as hot, that takes space in the cache for other things that are really hot. So we do want to be conservative about it. Yeah. Hey, hey, so thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to join into the earlier comment about uh, Clang, where basically in the talk that I did about serialization, I did see a major difference, uh, not with the benchmark, I should say. It was like 10% kind of, kind of area. But uh, you do see the instructions that are more likely promoted uh, near. And um, when you check for error, the branch is like, not taken. So basically, you see more uh, hot instructions near where you want them. Um, so maybe this has to do again with the placement of the likely, uh, unlikely attribute with the if statement between the if and the actual curly brace. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is that basically it would be interesting to look at the is prime example. Um, I think your conclusion was that uh, the likely was 10% faster. So it would be nice to also see the assembly because that was like uh, we compared the assembly from before, but we had it. Yeah, I think. Uh, right, um... Yeah. So uh, while uh, Tomer is trying to fetch the slide, uh, I would just want to emphasize the commentary by Eyal saying that it might be that Clang does work well, but it depends on the position yes. where you put the, the attribute. So we may check that again. But uh, and it refers also to the comment by Stefan. Yeah, th yeah, that slide I saw, like the, the actual assembly was. Yeah, you're, you're right. It wasn't yeah, on let, the let's slide. Let's talk about it later. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it was just, you know, too big uh, assembly. It's, it's hard to I fit see. on the side. Yeah, that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last thing is that I think you found uh, actually a nice, interesting bug additional to the bug that you already submitted, like with the unlikely, because when you place the unlikely, this is like an expression or some kind of a way to, for the programmer to express, hey, this is unlikely, so the compiler should like, not promote, like if, if the compiler already thinks this is unlikely, they shouldn't promote it to a more likely kind of thing, so this should be also a good candidate to find a bug, I think. Yeah, in, in a way we thought that you know, it is so obvious that the implementer probably knows about that. Okay. So uh, we, we can open a bag on that, but uh, it's it just to be recorded, to be there. Yeah, yeah. of course. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of interesting to look at how those uh, predictors work, because it's kind of interesting to see how the uh, GCC writers uh, thought about things. Uh, there's a bunch of predict predictors, like we saw, you know, returning early, returning a constant, things like that. Even comparisons, like bigger than, less than, equals, uh, that also feeds into things. And sometimes they play together, like in the example we saw from the Linux kernel, and sometimes they don't. There's just one predictor when it catches things, like in the likely or unlikely case, that's it. That's the predictor that takes the decision. Okay, good job. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. I have a comment and a question. The comment on the switch example is, you're already taking multiple iCache lines here, so problem probably the outcome of your measurements are not actually reflecting what's going on in the processor. And the question is, here this is prime example, did you compare the um, 
the time taken for doing your measurements if you actually make it such that it doesn't invoke undefined behavior in your example here. Probably a implementation without undefined behavior should give completely different results. So what, what kind, I mean, this is slide worse, so I don't think it, it's a good code, but what kind of uh, undefined behavior? The terminating condition invokes undefined behavior in almost all cases of n. We need to discuss that later because somehow we are not focused on, on, on the second part of the undefined. You say that there is undefined behavior here that we should be worried about or? Yeah, I don't know what you're actually um, measuring here. Maybe we take it. Okay, uh, as for the, the first comment, um, it is important and we played with that a bit the size of, of each branch. I mean, uh, the size of the branches, if the branch is big, it might fit the uh, iCache or not. It might be that you get both branches in a way uh, inside. So um, put aside CPU branch prediction, just hot and cold, uh, what gets into the cache. Uh, so we played with bigger branches, smaller branches, and eventually it is, again, a slide where it's, we just want to come with some uh, results. We see some uh, uh, that it affects, but we didn't analyze it fully. Um, uh, and again, the best way to analyze it in this case is to go to perf and see the cache misses. Sure. Thank your, you. Your table took one, at least one iCache line and your jumps afterwards, just the same. So it's the ordering and the compacting that makes the difference. But, but you have more than one iCache line in the yeah. level one cache, so my, it's, it's still And you need to take into account what the actual layout of the linking is. The actual what, sorry? The actual layout of your oh. code after the linking step. Yeah, and, 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 yeah and, and also Compile Explorer, when you look at it, it skips all the, um, um, all the padding that, <laughs> that uh, the compiler outputs. Uh, so yeah, you, you can't see it all. Um, one other thing to mention is that specifically Intel, I guess also others, have a, a, a decoded iCache there. So, yeah, uh, yeah so we, we actually have two iCaches. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the talk, very interesting observation. I, I have two comments and a question. So I think it's likely that the reason you saw the difference is the loop alignment. I believe there is a penalty on x86 uh, for loops not aligned at 32 bytes. So you might want to try some compiler flags that enforce this alignment. GCC knows about that and doesn't align. You don't see it in the assembly because uh, I, I moved, well, I moved it so it won't uh, take too much space. Although I, I think I did put uh, it as a hint there just in case you're interested. But um, I mean, yeah, if GCC is doing something not optimal with the P2 aligned there, before the label, before the L2. Uh, if it's doing something not optimal, that's a bug in GCC, I guess, um, because it should know about those things. I don't remember what's the default alignment. It's probably gonna be 16 bytes, not 32. Okay, but, but P2, I, I, I didn't write the whole expression. P2 is for any kind of uh, power of two. Yeah, so, so okay. except the default could be 16, not 32, and the Intel specific bit is 32 bytes alignment. And, okay. and, and then you say that adding the uh, uh, likely changes the alignment? No, it doesn't, but it, because you have two functions and when you flip them around, you change the offsets within the functions. Which is an important note. Right. We have to understand that there are many moving parts inside. So once you do some change, it might be you know, uh, affiliated to something that we didn't think about, or, 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 but at the end, oh, you added likely or unlikely, you thought that you are doing good, but might be that you affected something that hurt your performance, like, for example, loop al alignment. Yep. Yep. Uh, while we're on the uh, subject of Intel, whether it's 32 or 64, uh, that's like architecture, even microarchitecture yeah. details, right? Bytes alignment. Yeah. And 16 byte alignment. 16 byte. So, Sorry, yeah, so uh, it really matters the architecture, and uh, that's yeah. a question for anyone in the audience. If you, are really, you really care about performance, are you really compiling for your microarchitecture? It's just one compiler flag, right? Dash M tune or dash M arch. And uh, it could affect you significantly because then the compiler knows the correct alignments everywhere. 
so the second comment is about the uh, using a li uh, likely in a switch. You've used the values that um, use the jump table implementation. If you use larger values that use conditional, the compiler generates something like a binary search between your values. Mm -hmm. And then when you use likely on the labels that are likely, those conditions get checked earlier. So it does affect code gen even. Oh, that's, that's nice to know. Thank you. Yeah. So, so again, I think that this comment, in a way, says that it may affect other things that we didn't discuss, but which affect, at the end, the performance, and maybe in ways that we do not want. Yeah. Thank you very much for these comments and the I other. I have one more question. Or no? I think that we are done. A, a question here. So we would take, a, a, is there any question online? There is still one question online. So but we will take one question here, one question online, and then we would wrap up. Go ahead. So uh, again, on x86, even a perfectly predicted branch, I believe there is a um, extra penalty for, not penalty, cost for a branch that is taken that is not taken. Have you been able to observe something like that in the benchmark? That, that's very, I mean, you're talking about the misprediction? No, 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 the branches are perfectly predicted, but if okay. it's predicted taken, it oh. takes more cycles than it's, if it's predicted not taken. So basically, if you pass through it, it takes less cycles than if you... Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wanted, it wouldn't surprise me, but um, I think it will be just uh, noise in all the actual execution. It's very hard to measure such yeah, things. For sure. I mean, yeah. anything under 1% on per your performance is practically impossible to measure. And so again, I, cycle, yeah, yeah. I would relate your uh, comments to uh, compiling for the architecture. So the compiler is able to take into decisions, into its logic, the architecture that we want to run on, and it may affect the actual assembly and the actual uh, artifact. Right, thank, uh, you. thank you. A question online. This is a question by David Knott. You briefly mentioned a case where the exception code split a function in two, which provides an optimization due to code locality. Would this be a useful technique to add to our own arsenal where we manually split a function such that the unlikely branch goes to another function? Um, Okay, so this is interesting. In my research, I found that we have the likely and unlikely attribute, but uh, GCC also has a cold and hot attribute, and they're the same. So internally, if it is likely or it is hot, it's the same. If it is unlikely or cold, it's the same. I think you need to put the prefix uh, GNU uh, colon. But the hot and cold have something that the likely and unlikely don't have, um, which is you can mark the whole function as hot or cold. Uh, you can do that with unlikely, unlikely. you'll get a warning that it's uh, not supported. And then, yeah, you, you can um, mark your function as cold or hot and give that as a hint. I don't know if hot is going to help too much, but cold certainly can help. And um, split it up, I don't think it's possible just like that, but you, know, you can always write your function as two blocks and uh, split it up explicitly. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.